Hello and welcome to A Sense of Centerville in Washington Township, your place for stories about ordinary and extraordinary residents and places in the Centerville and Washington Township area. I'm Susan from Centerville, Washington History, and I look forward to hearing your story. Today my guest is Joellen Olliman. Joellen Olliman has been the curator for Centerville, Washington history for over six years. Prior to that, she was a language arts teacher for 23 years in Waynesville. Joellen has lived in Centerville for over 25 years. She loves spending time with her husband, two grown children, and her three grandchildren. In her free time, Joellen loves to hike, read, and stay fit. Welcome, Joellen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to have you here. We've been wanting to have you on the podcast for a long time, and Joellen uh, and I work together, and so it's really lovely to have her here and to share some of the um, responsibilities of her job at Center of Washington History, um, and then just some things that she enjoys about the job. So, um, so first of all, let's talk about what led you to this job. It was a long journey. Like you mentioned, I was a teacher for 23 years, and I loved it. I loved just the interaction with the students, the creativity, but most of all, feeling like I had an influence on the future, and hopefully it was a positive one. I'm sure it was, <laughs> yeah, for sure. But just, uh, and teaching kids to communicate well and to be curious about things that have happened before, that was important to me. And when I left teaching, I went to the hospital and worked at Kettering Hospital as a culinary ambassador which was super cool. I got to help people with menus. I had to bring orders to them, clear dishes, and I got to meet so many good people that way. And that was just a job that was a complete change from the teaching, yet I still wanted to still teach. There was something still driving me. Happened to be at dinner one night and came across Cheryl Meyer, who is now our director. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a personal friend. And she said, hey, I heard you retired from teaching. Would you ever consider maybe working for the Historical Society? We need a curator. She was like, I can't guarantee you a job, but I could pass your resume along. That's how I ended up here. And um, Vicki Bondi was our director at that time. And I am so grateful to her to actually hire me just straight off the street, pretty much, and just looked at my resume, met me several times you know, through the interview process. And she gave me an opportunity of a lifetime. And when I sat down today to really look at some of the things I'd done throughout these six or so years, I thought, wow, like this, I have done more than I just even thought I did. I've been so busy just, you know, working and, and doing these exhibits and giving presentations and sharing history with everybody. And uh, in fact, some people say, oh, please don't even ask her about that house or she'll go on forever about who <laughs> might have lived there at one time and who settled the land originally. Mm -hmm. But all of that has been such an exciting opportunity. So I'm grateful to Vicki. I'm grateful to so many people. And I'm mm -hmm. grateful to you, too, to actually make me sit down and think about this career that I have kind of carved out for myself. So thank you. I appreciate oh, no. it. No, it's fun. It's fun to share that history. Um, so let's tell our listeners and viewers, um, what does a curator actually do? Now, at Centerville Washington History, it might be different than other curators because we're a small organization, but go ahead and share. Yes, we are not the Smithsonian. Right. However, I laugh all the time. Um, in a way, a curator has a more vastly different job than if you worked for Dayton History or you worked for the Smithsonian or one of the bigger museum entities. Because we're small, this is a part-time job, all of our jobs are part-time, um, you have to jump in and do everything. And in fact, I love it because it feels like it hits my skill set that I had as a teacher and as a, as a person. And so I get to do all kinds of things. Our mission statement is that we collect, preserve, interpret, and promote our local history, and we connect people to their heritage. And that's exactly what I feel like I do every single day. So if you go to a bigger museum, as a curator, more than likely, you're going to have like a job like you're in textiles, or you're in the archives, or you're in the photography and, and the photos. And so with this job, I get to do it all. So for example, um, I do the collections, and so I'm in charge of taking in donations. Then I take those donations and take them through the process of cataloging them, photographing them, and saving them in our computer system so that others can find them, I can find them when I need them, and that they'll be there for the next generation too. 
next job is important. I have to preserve those artifacts and I have to store them properly and I have to keep them organized. So that's one aspect of the job. Another thing is genealogy. Oh my gosh, I've met so many incredible people while they're on their genealogy searches. So for example, people from the Sons of the American Revolution, Daughters of the American Revolutions are trying to connect to our patriots. And so they will come through us to see files. And no matter how much genealogy you do online, and it's wonderful resource, you will always end up in a little place like mine because you have to get your eyes on some of the original files at one time or another. So that's an important part of the job. Um, I keep all those records. I keep photos. I give people advice on how to preserve their family history. It's quite a job. I also get to do research, which is super fun. And I do it for anyone and everyone, um, my coworkers, members, uh, for the public, for the township, for the city, anybody who asks, genealogy seekers. That's how I also meet some really incredible people. I have people that will, will email me and say, I live at such and such an address. Like, what is that rock in my yard? Did Aaron Nutt put it there? <laughs> you know, so I get the fun questions. Um, I also have people that will call me from all over the country trying to get into our files to find out more about their relatives. And then, of course, writing. And writing is one of my favorite, favorite, dear to my heart things to do. And besides just writing those labels for the artifacts, I also get to write for the curator publication that we do. I write articles sometimes for other publications in the area. I write plays and scripts. I write tours. I write, um, I'm on the publications committee. So for example, we just redid our walking tour and um, did it in bullet points as opposed to doing it to paragraphs. Because I pictured people standing on the sidewalk in the blazing sun, looking at a building and saying, what? When was that built? Look in the booklet. And you're reading long paragraphs. So I thought, ha ha, it's time to bullet point. So I get to do those kinds of writings as well. I get to write for the exhibits. One time I wrote a play about Dr. John Hull, the pioneer revolutionary doctor. Mm -hmm. um, he actually, another incredible person I feel like I know from the past, from all the research I've done, he was a patriot. He served in the American War. And I had an opportunity to write a historical play. Something came across our desk that Greene County was searching for some new historical fiction, and they wanted to do something at Caesars Ford Theater that was a little different, what have you. So they had this festival, and so I got really excited, and I decided I'd like to write about John Hull, but I wanted to do it from his wife's point of view. Oh, okay. And that's another thing I absolutely love to do. I love to take a story and then figure it from different angles like each person who's involved in that how would that feel to be that person and your experiences are also a little bit different now it was challenging because as we know history is early especially early history is seen through the eyes of the men as opposed to the women I always joke that the women were very busy so and the men were too but um, I also though I thought, I, I want to see this through Massey's eyes, but also John's eyes. And Massey was his beloved wife. Mm -hmm. So I did this play and I had um, like they both. It was a really literally a two actor play. I envisioned it in my head. I also have these visions and I pictured it in a, in a dark stage and two spotlights. And as one character would speak, they would face the audience. Then they would turn and then the next character would face the audience and say her part about the part, about what he had just said or what she had just said. So I like to do that to give perspective. So that was an exciting piece of writing that I did. I also get to do uh, preservation. Actually, I do a lot of preservation. Lately, I look at it like we have the history, but today will be tomorrow's history. So as much as possible, like I'll collect obituaries from prominent people as they pass, put them in files. I encourage everyone and all of your listeners to create a family file. Doesn't have to be fancy. It could just be things thrown into a manila folder. Come and see me and I'll put it into our archives. So that way, going forward, your descendants can come and look for you and see what mark you left on this area. So um, I also go out and I do, for example... We're going to be building a rural outdoor education center. So that's preserving some of our farm implements and some of our farm equipment that we have and be able to share it with the public. And of course, I also collect any articles about famous people. During the COVID time period, I collected 
every single front page from the Dayton Daily News, well, actually the front section, from like March 13th, 2020, all the way through, I just pulled out the last article in early 2023 when our government said, nah, we're, we're done, done, we're done. Mm-hmm. But I had saved almost everyone for the first several months. I saved every single one. And they're stored in my house right now. And I just started this winter when I had a little bit of spare time to curate and decide which ones tell the story. I also took a lot of pictures. I walked around town and our many, many, many walks and took pictures of the effects of that um, quarantine. Reason why I did that was when this hit, everybody wanted to know what about the uh, Spanish flu in 1918? How'd that affect our community? I could find very, very little preserved. And I thought, doggone it, that's not going to happen again. The children of tomorrow (laughs) will know the story. So I started to collect all of that, too. And, of course, with the family files, as people come in, I save all of their things. I save whatever they have. If I don't have it, have a copy of that. And that way I can embellish the files, make them better. Create those exhibits. That's another part of the job. Um, The official ones, it takes a lot, a lot of hard time imagination and also, like, physical work to get those together. And I also take care of the small kind of micro areas in the museums, like when all of you call and you need something or something has fallen over or something that needs to be changed. That's my job to do that. And finally, I get to do presentations with my job, which is another part that I love. I love giving tours. When people come in to the Nut Cottage Research Center and I'll say, would you like a tour? They're coming into research, whatever. They all like, I'm curious about this building. And I'll say, do you want the 50 cent tour or the dollar tour? (laughs) And then I'll take them and I'll show them whatever the focus is that they would like to hear about. People of all different ages and from different places have come and taken my little mini tour. I help with the school tours. I help during events, our formal um, chats. I do four different presentations for our chat program. And I'm also sharing constantly. Like I said, I think I drive my husband nuts because... He's like, I hear one more thing about Aaron Nutt, Ben Robin, and Ben Archer. <laughs> Every single time a visitor asks, I always have a story. And so I think I, I, I probably drive people crazy with the history, but that's just part of the job. No, well, that's part of your passion. That's what, yeah. that's, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That's definitely a lot uh-huh. of, of different things. No wonder you're always busy because you've got to. <laughs> You've, but that's what makes it exciting. Most mm-hmm. curators in um, in museums are tucked away without a lot of interaction. But you could never live like that. You're oh, you're no. very uh, outgoing and and uh, extroverted. So that's very important that your job is that way. Yeah. At one point, like my husband did ask when I first got the job, he's like, "Do you just what, do what? Like you sit all there all day waiting for people to come in?" I laugh so hard, and um, our director. Our first director that I, the first director I had, Vicky, um, she said, "No, honey, don't worry. It comes January, February, March, we slow down. You're gonna have plenty of time to do all the other jobs that you have. It's never slowed down yet, and it's over six years. So, yeah, it's just a busy job. Well, and you can always find things to do as well. And I'd like to encourage people, um, especially young people, if they're even thinking about a job that involves history, that public history." is important and there's so many different aspects of it and I had a student come in a couple weeks ago she just graduated from Centerville High School and I was able to share with her my job she job shadowed for the entire day oh she had quite the day we had to go out and sort um, big pieces of wood for the outdoor education center and it was hot 95 degrees she really got a true look at being a small town curator and what you do And, um, of course, then explained the job and showed her around. And so, you know, there is, it's an exciting job. You're not going to make big bucks, but you're going to love every minute of it. Oh, and that's, that's the best. Yeah. All right. Next question. Oh, sure. Um, So favorite parts of the job? Favorite parts, I would say, number one, is just the interaction with people. And I've met so many different types of people from different walks of life and being able to see that that heritage, that genealogy that goes through the lines. As an example, the Nutt family was very uh, prominent and early in our in our history. We have a lot of their artifacts because they saved them and they gave them to us. And they, there are many of the family members were here for a very long time. Well, I have nuts coming in. I say falling off the tree, but nuts coming in from all over the country. From I've talked to them from California, from Oregon, from New York, from Indiana, from Florida. They've come to do their genealogy. 
And I can still see a bit of Aaron in them. And it's so amazing to me. One of the men um, who came in to, he was working on getting his Sons of the American Revolution um, appointment. And so he was coming in to do all the fact finding that he had to do. And he had to get into the Nut Family Bible. So that's how he came to see me. We're still friends. He came in oh, about five, six years ago, and we are still friends. And he still brings me things. He helps me out with little things. Um, it's just just little things about the, the Nut family or just, uh, just he's an amazing person. He's always looking out for our historical society. So I love being able to meet folks. And I, I met a Dr. John Hole, as I said, was also a patriot. I met like a sixth generation, like great, 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 great grandson of his who came in very early in my career. And he had called to make an appointment, lives in Preble County. And he's like, uh, ma'am, I'd like to come up and do some genealogy. And I'm like, oh, that's great. So we, he goes, but I work in the food industry. And so my hours are really kind of crazy. I said, no problem. We'll work this out. So this young man wanted to come up and we set up an appointment. It was March. And um, this was way pre the quarantine and COVID. And so um, I'm sitting there. He's supposed to be here at like three and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And he doesn't show up and he doesn't show up. I'm like, oh, it's okay. And so I get a call from his grandmother. He lives with his grandmother and he's, she says, oh, good, you're still there. Toddy wanted me to call and tell you that um, he just... He'll be there soon. He got tied up and he's bringing his sister and also his fiance with him. And it just took a while. And, and he just, he called me because they don't have a cell phone with him. And he called me from a payphone and said, please call and see if she'll still be there. He, they walk in a little disheveled. It's about five till four, our ending time. And I'm like, come on in. We were there till 630. I mean, I pulled out all those files. We had so much fun. And it was so exciting to see someone that excited at the, he had to be only 20, 21 years old, that excited. And he said he had come up here before and they had gone to Dr. John Hole's grave and that the flag that the veterans uh, and also the Boy Scouts put on a Memorial Day was shredded. He and his sister and his fiance went to the Walmart locally and got a new flag to put there. That's how much it meant to them. And it just was so fun to share all of it with him. So he and the fiance were getting married in July. So of course I had to send him a wedding card. <laughs> they were going down to Nashville and we kept in touch for a while. And I just, that is, those are the little stories that I love about my job. Yeah. It's, it's so amazing when somebody discovers about their history, mm -hmm. like being, knowing where you come from is, is, uh, uh, most people are very excited about that to mm -hmm. find out. Um, okay. Understandably. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, all right. So a few months ago, we unveiled a new exhibit. Um, tell us about how you create exhibits and specifically maybe this exhibit, because it's a wonderful one. It's a lot of fun and people uh, that come in uh, love love to look at the things. Well, thank you. Um, I, well, I made my list this morning and I was looking at what kind of exhibits I've done in like the six plus years. I've done 11 exhibits. It's no wonder I'm tired. That's a lot of <laughs> exhibits. And beyond that, I've also done five different Veterans Day exhibits in conjunction with our library system. We work on it you know, together and they let us house our exhibit there at the library. That's a lot of exciting work. Um, going back to one of the favorite things, the Veterans Exhibit. To me, I feel like that's such a service that we do for all those people who served and who care enough about all of us to be willing to make that ultimate sacrifice. I mean, that just that one just really touches me. Um, all of them do in one way or another. But the one of which you speak is called <laughs> <laughs> A Sense of the Oddly Fascinating. And that came to be because way back in 2017, when I first started, I was pulling things out for the museums and for a, an exhibit I was working on, a Victorian garden exhibit. And I'm wandering and finding things. And as great as our collection is, there's still a lot of what I call the mystery items. I'll come across these items with really no information, no cataloging, and I have to just try to figure it out the best I can. There's no history on them. I come across this item in the upstairs, in the back, and it's in kind of like a box that you might put, you know, something that has a cellophane top on it, and it's so it's see-through, and it's got tissue paper, and I thought, hmm, and there's a little note on it that says it's a um, hair wreath from like 1840. I'm like, whoa. So I pop it open and oh my gosh, it's a hair wreath. Like there's little ringlets of hair made into a wreath. 
And I screamed for a moment. <laughs> and then I thought, what the heck is this? And so I went downstairs and couldn't find anything about it in our files. So I started researching. And of course, that is a Victorian. Um, it was a tradition that when people passed, you would save a little locket of hair and create a wreath. So you always had a memory of that person. And I'm thinking, oh, that's creepy. I thought, no, it isn't. We do the same things today. I've got my two kids. I have their hair clippings and their baby books. Yeah, my parents did too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We saved that. I know people that if you lose somebody like that's very close to you, you'll put the ashes like in a piece of jewelry mm, and wear it. True. So, so we do the same things, and it's a way to keep that person close to you. Well, I was just oddly fascinated with that. And the longer I was there, the more odd things I kept coming across. So I kept a list on my desk of things that were oddly fascinating. And I would just jot them down, just put the location, put down the number if they had one. And I thought, someday I want to do an exhibit called A Sense of the Oddly Fascinating. So that's how this exhibit was born. Everybody who comes through, like on these little tours I told you about, I'd always show them that hair wreath. And they'd all be like, ooh, can I take a picture? Oh, that's so cool. So that is the beginning. That's the cornerstone of the entire exhibit. It's divided into five sections. I, Of course, I always layer my exhibits so that way it's about a topic. But I also have an underlying theme that you can kind of pick up on if you spend enough time in my exhibits. This one is in particular is... Anything can be fascinating if you let it be. Mm -hmm. You just have to look. And so I was just like looking at all these things and I thought, aha, you know, this is exciting. And so every time I do that exhibit, I also layer in that local piece. So whenever I could, I put in a local something. Um, one of the areas is Victorian death rituals. And we had actually an undertaker that lived up in the center of town, Nathan Lincoln, and he had a little shed back behind the home where he lived during a certain period. And he would have funerals in the living room. He built the coffins in the little shed. So I have a little picture of Nathan and his story there with the address. So that way, people coming to the exhibit can see these things and think, wait a minute, these things were used in Centerville. There's a connection to our community. The medicine cabinet shows our horse and buggy doctors, and um, I have their stories and their biographies, and we have a little QR symbol that you can connect to a larger biography if you'd like. But they're artifacts, because again, that's oddly fascinating, but as much as possible, I put in the addresses of where these doctors were, so that people get a, a sense of our community, what it used to be before we were here. Yeah, and we've had a lot of people come in and enjoy that. I, I think the hair wreath is 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 uh, one of the more fascinating things. And, um, you know, my grandmother had one, and uh, one that her grandmother made. So my great-great-grandmother made one. So this was very common, actually, <laughs> yeah. um, but still fascinating to, mm -hmm. to have. Can I mention one yeah, more yeah. thing? Yeah, oh, no, you should. Okay, yes. you notice I keep saying a sense of, a sense of, and you right. have done a uh -huh. sense of, you know, center of Washington Township, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. sense of our community. That's our tagline. And I have to give a Big shout out to those people who came be long before any of us, mm -hmm. because in the early 60s, these folks met as a club. They were going to their living rooms, having potluck dinners, and they started saving pieces of history. And then when it came time when we inherited the Walton House in 1971, it became time to actually share these with the community, put them out, tell their stories. And, you know, you can't include everything. So when we say a sense of, it's just to give you just whet your appetite. And if you want to learn more, come and see me. Come and see any of us. You can mm -hmm. always learn more about that topic. But this just gives you a little sense of that, which works really well because our museum spaces are small. Yeah. Yeah. And even like our publications and things, you can't get all of it captured. So I have to say, big shout of appreciation to the people that are way before us who actually thought to save it and then also come up with an idea of a tagline like that that works for everything. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I, I think that's really true is that all we can do is what we can do and just keep it going mm -hmm. for the next for the next people to take over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it'll be here after we're gone. So, um, okay, any other exhibits you want to touch on? I know when I asked Joellen what her favorite ones were, she said, they're all my favorite. Mm -hmm. So we can't talk about all of them. No. Is there There's 11. So, no, I will tell you, 
all my exhibits come about in pretty much the same way as Oddly Fascinating. I look at what we have. I look at perhaps timely events that are going on. Like, for example, the anniversary, if you will, of World War I was 17 and 18 for the United States. I started in 2017, and the 100-year anniversary would have hit, like, 1918 to 2018. So I did an exhibit on World War I, and I turned it into a presentation as well. So a World War One tribute, a sense of local sacrifice. So um, they all come to be in about the same way, and they're all my favorites. And when I take them down, I really have a hard time taking them down. I feel like I'm, I'm tucking away friends. And mm -hmm. pictures don't do it justice, but I get very, very close to every single one of them. Um, another one that I did that I think is kind of fun that's still up, it's been up for several years, is E-I-E-I, -E -I, whoa, a sense of early farming, because we were a farm rural community. And I just love just giving a sense of that. Well, since we were a farming community, there's so much there that in a small area, I can't capture it all. So I tried to give the best flavor that I could of what it was like from the very beginning uh, with the indigenous folks all the way through the suburban times. So mm -hmm. that's another, they're all my favorites. I, I can't, I can't, I, I'm not going to take all the time to do that. No, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And if you have seen some of them, you'll understand that Joellen puts together things um, very artistically. And so it's, oh, it's you. fun to see, um, you know, how you create, uh, you know, you have many creative aspects and this is just one of them. Okay, so let's move on with our questions. Um, in addition to your work as curator, you also do presentations around the community about historical topics. Can you share your process for developing presentations? Pretty much the same as the exhibits. A couple of my presentations came from exhibits, like the World War I, A Sense of Local Sacrifice, came directly from the exhibit with the same topic. Um, also, incredible local ladies, a sense of strength, incredible local ladies from history. Another and favorite. That was, our pro that was a past one at yeah. um, Ashville, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And now it's become a presentation, so it still lives. So I just pretty much things that I thought uh, that I think or somebody says, hey, look, people want to know about, do you have... And I also, you need to know your collection and you need to know what we have and you need to know what kind of history we really do have in order to create a presentation. Um, a lot of things happen that weren't recorded or not formally recorded with us. And so, um, like, for example, I had the DAR contact me. I've done two presentations for them already and they wanted a third one and they wanted to know if we had anything on another Patriot. And... You, can I give like a teaser for the future? Absolutely. But let me, while you're okay. DAR's Daughters of the American Revolution, Thank just, you. just for the people that are, what is that? Yeah, what <laughs> so, is that? Okay. Good idea. Um, yeah, so th thank you. Um, so they wanted, and so 2025 is a 250 year commemorative date of the beginning of the American Revolution. I am so excited because I want to do some special things for the community, have special activities, create an exhibit. I love it because we have several patriots in our area. However, we have one of the city co-founders, Mr. Aaron Nutt, and the first settler in the township, who happens to be Dr. John Hull, both patriots who will represent all of these fine men who came here after the revolution, coming to the Northwest Territory to seek a different life. And so um, I told the lady from the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, I'm like, you know what? I really need to be starting to research Aaron Nutt. I'd be happy to put a presentation together for you because I'm doing double duty. I'm not just creating a presentation. I'm also now creating something for the future um, that I can use when I put together an exhibit. So um, sometimes it comes on a suggestion like that. You know, so you, sometimes it's just because it's something that I love. Um, Dr. John Hull's story, the revolutionary pioneer doctor of Montgomery County. He actually, like I said, I, I wanted to see things through Massey's eyes. And so his wife, his wife. Mm -hmm. and I had done the play and I thought this could be a presentation. <laughs> and so I actually come out, I do the presentation. I tell the story from her point of view to the best of the ability I have for the resources I had at hand. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that one came about. 
Mm-hmm. So just whatever, you know, whatever somebody needs, if it's feasible, I'll be glad to try to work it out. But it also depends on schedules because I have a lot going on and it takes hours to get a presentation together, complete with a PowerPoint to get it to the point where I feel like it's good enough to show the public. Yeah, for sure. It really does. And it takes so much energy to speak in front of people. Um, so that's, that's, that's good that you're working on that skill and, and you've got a couple of presentations under your belt. So that really helps. Yeah. And I, I, I portray like three different women from the 1800s uh-huh. in one way or another. And Massey is number one, like the early 1800s when I portray her. You know, I dress like her. I try to speak the way that I think she may speak. Um, and then I do one from 1862, the Unity Kelsey story. She was the widow of the first murder victim in the mm-hmm. area. And so I first recorded murder victim in the area. I'm sure there were plenty of others probably, but um, so I portray Unity and tell her tragic story of the night when her husband was shot right in front of her in cold blood. And then I portray Ida Weller, school mom from 1897, when I help with the third grade tours. I get to dress and like they Ida. they love that. That is one of their most favorite things at the, at the school <laughs> tours. But I, but I do it very simply. I go to Goodwill and just find outfits. I mean, I try to, and each lady has her own different style, different look, different way of speaking, because I want them to be different. So when you talk about like presentations and how they come to be, and then just trying to get them from beginning to end, it, it takes a lot of heart and time. Mm-hmm. And you have a lot of heart. Okay, wonderful. Um So sharing local history is the main focus of Washington, um, Center for Washington History. Um, What are your favorite tours to give? Oh, I already know the answer to this. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not. Oh, maybe. Okay. (laughs) I love giving cemetery tours. I I knew that was going (laughs) to guess that. (laughs) And I mean, it just... I love being able to tell the stories of people that were here before us and paint a picture of community and paint a picture of dedication. And so, for example, the Sugar Creek Baptist Church Cemetery, I did a uh, tour through there that can you get to on YouTube. And it's right behind Chiapas. It's right behind Chiapas. So you can Mm -hmm. go have a great dinner and then go take a little stroll. 14 fine early families. And I love to see uh, people actually taking that tour because I live right behind the cemetery on Maple Avenue. And often my husband and my kids and my grandkids, they may be over. Yeah, we're out there. We're looking over. And there are people walking around the cemetery taking the tour, mm-hmm. which always makes me feel like, good, people are learning about some of the earlier history. I also love a tour that I just developed last summer, which does the uh, Somerville Cemetery, which is up there on Maple Avenue mm-hmm. ac- across from Ridgeway. And so um, it's a historic cemetery, but it's a little more recent. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's the only one of the six historic cemeteries that's non-denominational. But there are very, very early graves in there. And so we go from that all the way through a couple of the educators in the area, some of our veterans. So that's a that's a fun tour too. Yeah, very important people, yeah. Yes. And I, I love giving any tours. I mean, I'll give people tours. They just have to ask. I'll be glad to do it. Yeah, if you have time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's great. Um, okay. So since part of your job is to preserve and store local artifacts, I thought you might have suggestions on how our listeners can preserve their own family heirlooms. I'll be happy to do that. In fact, I I had some lady about a year ago make an appointment just to come in and talk about that very thing Mm -hmm. because she's going to be the gatekeeper of her family's history. And she's like, I'm not sure what to keep, first of all. And then I'm also not sure how to keep it. So let's talk about what to keep. Mm I would say anything that is an original document, like a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, a divorce certificate, a a deed, anything like that, you definitely want to save all of that. Um, I would also say, as far as pictures go, it's overwhelming. You can't save every single photo. So you want to paint a picture of your family history. You need to step back from it, like you're looking through a telescope instead of a microscope. So step way back. Look at the whole view. What's the story you want to tell about your family? So, for example, things that are important, religious beliefs, um, education, um, lifestyle, places where they lived. Those are the things that when you start looking at photos, do you need six pictures of Uncle Charlie's farm? You could probably use one. Do you need, you know, like I've, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, my cell phone's filled with them, but do you need a whole bunch of pictures of, you know, Junior going to his prom or do you just need one really good one? And so that's the way you can make the decision sometimes of what you want to save. I tell people to go to like Gaylord or Talus, one of the archival preservation companies. It's worth the investment to get the boxes and the acid-free tissue paper. For 
articles that are like textile or just even some of the little things like little trophies, whatever, you can wrap them in that, put them in the archival ba boxes, and that will help to preserve them. Not going to keep them forever, but at least that will help and give you a good start um, to try to keep them at least for the next 50 years. And then you can just let the next group move on from there. Um, I tell people also, like as far as um, things like the paperwork, even putting sheets of the acid-free paper in between your sheets are good. Whatever you do, never, ever, ever use scotch tape and staples. They are the artifacts enemy and the archives enemy. I pull out so many staples in our files of things that were stapled and now they're rusting. So they're de kind of destroying some of the, the writing in the paper. Um, and also tape. <gasps> I found tape on an artifact and I almost had a heart attack. I'm like, no, not tape. <laughs> um, the magnetic, the old magnetic scrapbooks, which were so, they were so popular when yeah. we were kids. Yeah. They are death to yeah. your photos. They really are. And I went out and took a class, set in on a class, and actually with a, a person who does preservation, teaches preservation at Wright State of photographs. Mm -hmm. And she said, don't just tear them out. You're going to do more Rip damage. Them, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you can gently kind of lift them from the page, it might be worth trying, but you're going to rip a lot of stuff by trying to get them off that magnetic background. So always think in that direction. And again, think about a story. Like, what is it that you want to tell? I created a questionnaire for my own family because... Thanks to the Dr. John Hold descendant, Toddy. But he left that day. He goes, ma'am, please tell me you've done this for your own family. You know so much about mine. I said, no, I don't have time. <laughs> so we had a family reunion last summer. And I created a questionnaire that I gave to my family members. Out of the whole group that came, maybe 50 people, I got maybe eight of them back. That's okay. That's how history is going to work. You're going to save what people give you. And the things that I was given are wonderful. Have I done anything with them? No, not yet. But I do have them ready to go. And on the questionnaire, I think about what people come in to ask me. And the dates and all that, you can find those on deeds. You can find those on certificates, you know, diplomas, what have you. But the thing people want to know, like, what was he like? What was she like? How did, how did she act? What kind of jobs did she have? So on my questionnaire, with every single person, I said, you know, tell me you know, what you know about your mother, dates, what have you, schooling. Tell me about your father. And I always said next to that, claim to fame. What is that person's claim to fame? Are they the best pie baker in the family? Are they the funniest? Do they do funny card tricks? Do they do dad jokes all the time? But something that when you think about it, when they step back, what do people remember about that person? And luckily, we have some of that from Aaron Nutt's family and also a little bit from John Hole's family, from some of the, the things that were preserved, that we get a picture of them as men, not just as, you know, settlers of the area. Yeah, those those little stories really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And one of the things um, that I have in one of my family histories is my aunt had actually drawn a picture, a floor plan, a floor plan of her grandmother's house. And that's just such a unique oh, thing to have, wow. you know, because, you know, I have a picture of the front of it and they talk about the different parts, but actually being able to visually see it was, it was something I wouldn't think to put in mm -hmm. a family history, but it's, it's kind of fun to see. That yeah. is, that's very yeah. cool. I like yeah, that idea. Yeah, it's fun. I'll pass that along if you don't mind. Yeah, no, right. I never mind. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's go to... So many of our artifacts we get from donations. Mm -hmm. How can someone determine what things might be interesting to our museum? I would say, number one, go to our website. I have a list there. It's a very general list, but it will give you some idea of the things for which we're looking. Number two, please, please, please realize that when you contact me, and please call me, because I know our collection. I can save you a lot of time and heartache by trying to drag it in somewhere or trying to call a bunch of different people. Just, just call me and we'll have a conversation. I know our collection well enough to know um, what we have, what we don't have, what we might want to fill in. Um, I will tell you this too, we have a space problem. Everybody has yes. a space problem. <laughs> so you can't save everything. So I tell folks, I say, I, not to hurt your feelings. It's nothing against that beautiful you know, fur coat or it's nothing against that butter churn, but we just don't have the space. We don't have a need for it. So mm -hmm. 
it's better off to go ahead and pass along to someone else. And I'll always give suggestions of where else you can pass things. I will also tell you that we have an antique mall booth. And so I will pass things along to Ed Ross, our president, who runs that booth. And any donation that goes there and sells, we get the proceeds. So you're still donating to us. Yeah. As much as possible, I try to use the precious articles in some way, shape, or form, but not everything can be saved. So look at my list online and say, does it fit that criteria? Did it belong to someone in Centerville or Washington Township? Or does it show a time period in which Centerville and Washington Township was thriving or about? Um, look at those things. If you have like a mechanical item of some sort, do you still have the manual that goes with it? And I always like to talk to people because I want to get stories as well. So the Incredibly Fascinating has some fascinating things that were given to us. And I've tried to collect the stories from the people who have given these things to us recently. And the older stories, I, sometimes I, we just don't have. But um, yeah, just kind, of, just kind of use a little bit of that common sense. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, those, those are great ideas. And I know the collection that we have has been so carefully... Um, set out and displayed um some of the things we have are just so interesting and fun to see so it's 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 been lovingly cared for for you know since the beginning of our organization thank you and it really has been yeah. and i always say yeah. that's that's the goal is we want to hear for the next 50 60 years right. so we have to take care of it now yeah yeah definitely Okay, so small historical societies are a great place to do family history research. How can local residents be involved in preserving their family history? And you mentioned a little bit of this earlier, mm -hmm. um, but... I know. would say, once you start gathering up your family history, um, make a copy for me. <laughs> Call me and make an appointment. Yeah. I am more than happy. We have two file cabinets. One is with the early settlers, the early pioneer families from our area. And the second one is just local people who live here now, families that have come through. You don't have to be the mayor of Centerville or you don't have to be, you know, like the, the first guy to build a house in a subdivision out in Washington Township. You just have to be you. Mm -hmm. And so if you have anything you think in the future, people would like to know something about that. Mm -hmm. Let's think about that. When you do like a familysearch.com or you do ancestry.com and you're looking for your relatives and it will say like died in Montgomery County, died in Centerville, Ohio, buried in, you know, Centerville uh, Cemetery. Wouldn't you want to know like, well, what did they do in Centerville? Mm -hmm. And I have had people contact me just recently this summer who have said, my family passed through Centerville. I want to know what they did. Did they leave a mark? How long were they there? I think they were only there for a year. Do you have any information on them? Because they had done those searches online, and now they want to know what was it like for them here. And it, it also makes me feel sad when I can't answer the questions. I can't get what they want. And it's okay. I have to forgive myself. It is not a perfect science. It's not like back in the day people had cell phone cameras. You know, people didn't jump off their their wagons and take pictures of the family coming across the, the forest and trying to get to their, their new settlement. So, you know, we have to forgive ourselves as a, as a human society that we, we could, and we can only save what we can save. But going forward, if you can give a little bit of that, that history, I tell people, if you've drawn out some kind of a family tree, even if it's not fancy, something like that, and I also tell them on that family tree, put that claim to fame by those people for the people, when you know that, put that on there so that that way, um, I'll type up a little label, drop it in a manila fo folder for you, and I'll save it here for you. So you are yeah. part of the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's w part of what we're doing here is trying to collect stories of people that mm -hmm. are from this area um, and, and broad, you know, not just the, the, the most important people, mm -hmm. not the mayors, but the, the workers. You know, what mm -hmm. kind of things were they involved in? Um, people of different nationalities and different mm -hmm. colors. All of those stories help to create um, where we are right now. Exactly. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners and viewers? I'd like to say that it's really been an honor to have this position. And I feel like very humbled by being able to be the preservationist of all these treasures from Centerville and Washington Township. And I have to laugh a little bit because some of our treasures don't quite look like the crown jewels or anything like that. They're not the Hope Diamond, but they're treasures to us. Mm -hmm. And so it has been such an honor and to work with all the people and all the families I've gotten to know. I just, I admire those folks from the past so much and I just am so grateful to them grateful to Vicki for hiring me and Vic, thankful to you to give me a chance in the middle of a very busy summer to stop and say, 
wait a minute, this is why I do this. Yeah. So we're celebrating that you have mm-hmm. the, have had this opportunity to be an important preserver of our history for six years and hopefully <laughs> much longer. So I'm trying. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being here today and appreciate you taking your notes and kind of explaining a little bit about what you do mm-hmm. and if you want to get a hold of Joellen, uh, you can check out our website, and her her um, phone number should should be on our website. And you can give her a call and talk to her about uh, family history or her presentations. I'm sure she would love to talk to you about that. Or come in and take a tour. Yes. Happy to do that. So, and it is a fun fun little <laughs> building. Very very cute. So thank you to MVCC for helping to produce this podcast. And of course, my guest, Joellen Olaman. If you have an interesting story about Centerville or Washington Township, please contact Centerville Washington History. Please also come visit our museums in Uptown Centerville, Tuesday through Friday, 12 o'clock to 4 p.m. Follow us on Facebook or Instagram and watch for upcoming events posted on our website at centervillewashingtonhistory.org. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.